Hey, hey, welcome everybody to Smooth On's YouTube Live on glowworm phosphorescent powders. My name is Heather. I'm a technician here at Smooth On, and I'm going to be assisted today with the presentation with Jason. Hello. He's our moderator. You're probably going to hear him speak throughout this. You'll also hear Alex. He's in charge of our audio visual team. So if you have questions during this presentation, please feel free to type them into the chat, and either Jason or someone from his team are going to help you out and answer all your questions. If you have additional questions that uh, after this presentation or during it, you can also go to smoothon.com and we have a support link there where you can type in uh, questions or find our toll-free tech support number. So uh, let's get right into what you're gonna learn today. So we're gonna learn about the glow powders and we're gonna learn how the glowworm powders are gonna transform your castings in just minutes. We're also going to learn how they can save you time and money because it's so quick and easy to use. We're going to talk about our exciting new colors that have been added to our original glowworm line. We want to talk about material options, ways to, that are most effective to use with the glow powders. And we also want to talk about coating a model surface, uh, which is also known as a gel coat, versus just pouring a whole binge, big bunch of material into a mold. We're also going to talk about best practices for charging our finished castings for getting a long glow time. What materials are we going to cover today? So we're going to talk about our glowworm powders. We've got our original yellow green and our original uh, blue green. We're going to talk about our new colors as well. We've got purple passion, flamingo pink, creamsicle orange, mint green, bold blue, and electric yellow. We're going to talk about casting materials like Smoothcast 325, Smoothcast 300, both urethane resins, Ecoflex 0030, platinum cure silicone rubber, Eurocoat, urethane rubber coating, XTC 3D, which is an epoxy uh, print coat, and also Eurofill 11, which is one of our fillers. So let's get started today talking about um, what is actually a phosphorescent powder. Um, the term you may be familiar with is a glow-in-the-dark powder. Um, so glowworm are glow-in-the-dark powders that you mix into certain materials in order to make them have kind of like this glow-in-the-dark appearance. But Phosphorescence, like what is that? You've got these powders that kind of like absorb light. So the daylight energy goes right into the powders. It stores it, absorbs it, and then it's going to release it over time. Uh, usually you're going to see this glow effect the best when there's the absence of light or in the dark, So which is where we get the glow in the dark from. Uh, when you're using our powders, they won't just automatically glow. They need to be charged up. So when you charge them up, you could use something as simple as daylight, taking them outside so the UV light charges them. You could use like these studio lights or lights, incandescent lights, maybe in a room or a building that you're in. Um, you could also use a flashlight or like this is a UV black light. Uh, if you're familiar with a UV or a black light, and that's almost like an instantaneous quick charge, which I might be using uh, during this demonstration just to show you some quick glow effects. Um, again, they're most seen and easiest to see, to see the glow in the dark. So we've actually created this little like glow zone. So we have this little glow world that we created for you because obviously right here, you're not going to see the full effect of the glow. So below me, right down here, under this table here, actually has a little bit of a glow zone. And just so you can see what that might look like, um, here's an example of a piece. We have a black light or UV light under here um, to quickly just show you what something glowing might look like to simulate the dark. So you might see me reach down there and show you something um, just so that you can get a quick idea of what that glow effect looks like. So if I'm down there, I'm in the glow world. Um, let me show you also what our glow powders look like in their dry form. So right under here, I've got this special setup, uh, which is the glow powders in dry form. So if you're not familiar with our powders, let me just try to introduce them real quick. So right here are our two originals. These two right here were um, original yellow green and, uh, and original yellow blue, uh, blue, blue green. So notice there's a daytime appearance and a nighttime appearance. So we're in the light right now, daylight. This is the daytime appearance. So these kind of have this light, kind of lightish greenish yellow look to them. When they glow, they do glow differently. One will be more of a greenish and one will be more of a bluish color. Our brand new colors, which we've introduced, which are these here, their daylight appearance is very different. Daylight appearance here, flamingo pink, creamsicle orange, electric yellow, mint green, bold blue, and this white one is actually kind of uh, whitish, light, kind of gray maybe, but more white. This is actually our purple passion. So when you charge these up, 
uh, letting them kind of absorb the daylight, whether it's from a flashlight, ambient light, or daylight outside, they're going to charge up, even on their own as dry powders, um, they're going to charge up. But once you put them into one of the mediums, such as the ones I'm going to demonstrate today, you'll notice that they'll store that energy and then release it in the glow. The longer you charge it, the longer they'll be able to store that energy. We usually recommend you know, as little as five minutes, but up to 30 minutes, even an hour if you had to. Uh, and these will glow for uh, many hours. The brightest glow is typically within the first 20, 30 minutes where it's like super bright, where I've taken it into a dark room and I could actually like see a shadow cast and I could actually read text. Um, that's how bright some of them glow. If you just charge it for one second, it doesn't have time to absorb that daylight and store it and release it. So giving it a little bit of time, um, it really distinguishes our powders from other powders that are available. The technology of the powder is such that um, letting it uh, charge up and glow, these can charge up to 10 times even longer than some of the other powders out in the market right now. So they're very exciting and we're excited to show you how to use these today. So the other thing that we want to talk about, other than their daytime and, and nighttime appearance, um, are some of the applications. Like, why in the world would I even want to use glow powders other than they're just awesome and fun and I love them? Uh, why would you want to use them? There's a lot of applications. I'm going to show you uh, some of those applications just to give you an idea of things maybe you didn't realize. Uh, if you've ever gone into, for instance, like a movie theater or ridden on an airplane, you might see safety. Like, oh, here's the exit, and you might see glowing paths. Those are usually either lights or glow powders. If you're in, say, a movie theater or um, an office building, you might see an exit sign. So it could be something as simple as this, a signage, or even some lettering, maybe even on a home. And I'll show you what that looks like glowing. These are two of our glow powders, our creamsicle and our mint green. So you can see what that looks like. So I poured two of them together so you can get a unique effect with two glow powders. So nice for some signage. You can even kind of see this is just being in there a few seconds, it even has like a bright glow to it. You might also see somebody do something fun like cosplay or props. So for instance, maybe this is a silicone material, maybe I want to wear a mask. So this is in our silicone rubber, we've got our glow powders, and you can kind of see it would be flexible and move on your face and it would be something in the dark. You might also do a prop, something like this is one of our little like horns or teeth. So I actually added paint to this. So once these are cured, they're, it's a piece of plastic when you use resin. I actually painted this. This one's a little darker, a little bit of a lighter wash and nothing. And I'll show you what that looks like. If I can get it in here. So here is where I painted a little bit darker. And as I painted lighter and lighter, you can see some of the texture on the piece to zero. And you can get an idea of what that would look like. You could do props. Maybe you're doing movie props. Show you what this looks like under here. And I'll try to get that so you can see it. And again, the, larger, the longer you let these um, absorb the light or charge up, the brighter and more sustained that glow is going to be. Imagine if I wanted to do something like a life, ca a li a life casting. And with that life casting, I just wanted it to be either for myself, just for fun. Maybe I wanted it to be for something Halloween, like a haunt, or even a movie set, something like that. Here's a life casting, and the, what I did was I used our flamingo pink. And just so you can see what that looks like, boom. And there's my hand in glow in dark flamingo pink. You could also do uh, aquarium pieces. A lot of pieces in an aquarium or even a themed environment. It could be something at a theme park or something for your own home, your own hobbies. You could do some of these corals. Notice the daylight appearance is one thing, and you, know, you can actually get a different glow appearance in the night. So what I'll do is you could take a look at these, and these are all using our glow powders. I'll put some under here so you can see them. And the glow powder appearance can be very different in the daytime and the nighttime. You can combine them and get really cool effects, and I'll show you a little later how to kind of mix them up. The other things that you can do are jewelry. For instance, these are all of our new colors and our original colors in bracelets. You can also do super cool earrings that glow in the dark. You can also do, maybe you've got something that you want to actually do serious, like an industrial type of thing, where you know at night you need to know where the exits are, so you have an exit sign, or maybe you have like a door stop, you need the door open. The, this would actually glow in the dark here. You can kind of see that. Nighttime appearance is this original blue, and look at the day appearance. It's more of like this 
like yellowish, greenish kind of light color. You can also do, depending on what you want, something crazy like a skull, just so you can have an idea. This one, I mixed a whole bunch of different colors, added some of our colorants, and got like a swirl effect. And I'm going to show you what that looks like under here in the black light, if I can get it through into the glow zone. And here you go. So depending on how you want to showcase your work, you can actually put a light inside this too, but pretty creepy. And it's only just immediately charged right now on our black light. So imagine if you were able to let it charge up and glow on its own. You'd get a really unique look. I mean, honestly, the, po the possibilities are pretty endless when it comes to coming up with things that you might want to do. You can also mix our materials in gypsums. So this is our Duo Matrix Neo. This white one, kind of cream color, actually has one of our glow powders in it. You just can't see it. This has our electric yellow in it, which gives it that look of color in the daylight appearance. And let's see what they look like in the dark in our glow appearance. Very different as far as this blue guy right here, a little blue gnome guy. And this one looks more similar to its daytime appearance. So I hope that gives you some ideas of things that you can actually make or do. Uh, honestly, the possibilities are endless. You can do, I mean, trivets. You can do, actually, even our foams. If you want to do like some of our foams, check this out. So here's our flamingo pink and some foam, squish, squish. Pretty neat. Um, there's so many things that you can do. These are just kind of the beginning to get you started, but you can also use them with even cast magic. So on the front, I dusted some of our cast magic powder, so I get kind of like, ooh, it's like pearlescent, that's pretty. But guess what? This sucker glows too. Where it goes. So this guy right here, I'll do a quick charge for you here. This one actually glows a purple color. If I can find the light, there it is. So you get some, floor, you get some glow there uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of getting it kind of glowy. And you can also do, if you wanted to, you could do uh, a piece with nothing on it and you get a glow here. Same gem, different amounts of powder, different amounts of glow, things like that. And you can definitely achieve different looks. The other thing that you want to consider as far as like what you're doing is, um, what do you want to do at the end? Like what's your end result goal? That's where we start talking about the materials. Like, what material do I choose to mix it into to achieve the goal that I want? Am I painting it after? Do I need it to be rubber-like or foam? Um, things like that. What color do I want it to look in the daytime and the nighttime? Um, that, those type of questions, you can always give us a call and we can try to help you out and in terms of figuring out combinations. There will be some experimentation that you choose um, you know, in order to figure out what you want. But what I'm going to kind of teach you today is the basic system and basic techniques in order to get you where you want to be. Um, there's really only two things that comprise the system, really, and that's the color powder you want um, and the medium or the casting material that you're putting it into. So in terms of that, it's relatively simple. Um, choosing the material is another story. Um, the two techniques that are most basic would be taking that powder, mixing it into a material such as a resin, uh, mixing it and pouring it. Or you could mix it in and brush it. You could brush it onto a surface to create a gel coat, or I could make a coating out of it using something like our Eurocoat, like I'll show you, or our XTC. So brushing as a coating, mixing and pouring, those are your two main techniques um, to go with the system. So picking the material that you're going to mix into, picking the, 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 cut, the powder, the technique that you want, and then thinking about um, the materials that you choose and why you choose them. So in terms of that, when you see these materials that I have here, these all have the original uh, yellow green, which is this powder here. So this powder here looks like this in, in the daylight. And when you mix it into a clear material, such as Smoothcast 325, or you mix it into a translucent material, such as Smoothcast 57D, that's these two guys right here, um, you get more of, I would call it like a, a bright glow or a raw glow. It gets so bright. Um, these two here, this one is Smoothcast 300, which is an opaque white color. This one right here is Smoothcast 320, which is an off-white color. They also will glow, but you get to see more detail of the piece versus more of just this bright light coming out. And the reason why for that is when we're choosing materials is, um, you know, 
when, when I was telling you about how the light has to come in and charge it up and it has to absorb it, when you use an opaque material or if you add a colorant, it's kind of like blocking the, the UV light from coming in. And then when that light wants to uh, emit and glow, it's kind of blocking it or filtering it, if you will. So you still get a glow and a charge, but not as strongly as you would with something clear because nothing's blocking it. So let's take a look at what they might look like in the dark. And so when you're looking at these photos in the dark or looking at these in the dark, the two uh, clear ones you can see are a little bit more bright. So the 57D is translucent. The Smoothcast 325 is going to be a clear amber. The two that you see more detail on are the opaque materials. So you see that there's still a glow, but look at, look at how much de more detail that you get from that. You can actually see it a little bit more. The, the glow is slightly, slightly diminished, but it's still there. Um, even if you were to use something uh, black, like we have our Smoothcast Onyx, so I'll show you what that looks like. So even with Smoothcast Onyx, so if you were to add a color or you're using Smoothcast Onyx, which is just a black color on its own, I'm going to use the UV light and show you, even with a color, although it blocks the light from charging it and from the light coming out, you, you can still receive a glow. And I'm going to show you that under here in our glow zone. If you can see that. I'm going to see if you can see it up here. How's that? So it's, the UV light does like an instant, if you will. So look at that green glow. Very different than if I were to use, say, Smoothcast 325, which is very evident that you get a quick glow with it. But there is still a glow, and you can add colorants to them. You know, it's not going to be the end of the world if you add a colorant to it. For instance, with our purple, here's my little dragons. So with my purple, uh, this is the normal color, which is kind of like a whitish color. This is what the uh, purple passion looks like in the daylight. I added some so strong purple to it so that because I kind of wanted it to look purple. Now, when I make them glow, the cool thing about it is because they still have the purple glow powder in there, I can still achieve a purple look. So the daytime look and the nighttime look can be similar but different. And I'm going to see if you can see that here and in the glow zone. Let's see. So hopefully you can see them. So you can see them both glowing, slightly different. There is a little bit more detail on the one that has the purple color, which I think might be uh, hard to see unless you can zoom in. But just so that you can note the difference when you're looking at things, opaque or adding colorant, block some of the UV light from coming in and block some of the light from glowing or emitting out. Uh, but it's not the end of the world. You, you still will get a glow. It just might be a little less as far as the duration of the glow, maybe a little bit less bright, but you'll still get a nice glow uh, either way. Um, the other thing that you want to consider with the materials is, what's the mix ratio? How do we do it? Um, we normally recommend, if you're doing something like Smoothcast 325, one part A, one part B by volume, that's a urethane resin, one part uh, by volume of powder. You are going to have the ability to vary the amount of powder that you use. If you add more powder, it tends to make things a little more thick. Sometimes that's good because maybe you want to brush it, but also it can be harder to pour. If you add too little powder, you may not have enough powder that's evenly dis um, dispersed throughout the piece, and it may not look even or it might kind of not glow as strongly. So usually one-to-one -one, um, mix ratio materials, one-to-one -one, or one part by volume is a good way uh, for you to get a good glow. You can vary it and experiment. I've tried adding different powders together I, don't, I think it looks muddled, and I don't think it looks that good, but it is an option as far as mixing powders. I prefer to do things in layers um, to where I can get more of a distinguished look. But again, that's the fun of it. You can, do, you can experiment and do what you want to do. Um, the other thing is, is all of these materials that I've discussed here are very quick setting materials. That's also what we recommend. If you have something that's going to take a long time to have a pot, long pot life, long cure time, you might notice something like this, like our uh, Epoxycast 690 which is going to be an overnight type of cure, the powder actually settled out. Like if you can see all this powder at the bottom, it didn't stay suspended. It actually like settled to the bottom. So that's no good. It doesn't look good. None of this really glows. Only the glow powder that settled at the bottom glows. So that's why you have to consider what material you're using as well as the powder, because if the timing is too long, it's just going to settle out. So best recommendation, something quick setting, something that's going to be translucent or clear, and that will give you the best glow, the best charge, and the best um, suspension throughout the material so the materials don't sink. Um, like I said, you can add colorants to them. 
Um, however, just keep in mind it will diminish the glow, but at least you get a daytime look that you might enjoy. Um, the other thing to consider is, as with any dry powder, any of our fillers or any other dry powder additives such as Cast Magic or anything that you might add to it, Corytone, whatever, dry powders can absorb atmospheric moisture. So why do you care? Uh, if you're using something like an epoxy, epoxies don't really mind about moisture. They don't have moisture sensitivity. That's not going to really cause anything. If you're using a fast setting uh, urethane, um, don't think that just because it's fast setting that they won't be affected. Urethanes have moisture sensitivity, and so if there's a lot of moisture in here, you're basically going to notice maybe some bubbles are foaming, um, which can happen as a reaction. Easy solution. Uh, put it on a, a bake, line a baking tray, maybe at a quarter inch thick, bake it out at 150 Fahrenheit for maybe uh, a couple hours, two, three, four hours, and then put it in a container that's airtight, throw some desiccant packs in there that will absorb moisture, and you're good to go. Easy peasy. Um, those are all, I mean, that's the basic kind of like thing about our glow powders or our phosphorescent powders. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Question about yeah. using this for outdoor yeah. um, applications. Mm -hmm. I know you could mix it in with Neo. Yes. Um, you know, but you would have to seal a Neo piece if you're going to put it outdoors. Mm -hmm. And certain sealers may have UV Correct. resistant um, properties to them. You'd, you'd kind of have to test it out. I don't know yeah. if we have a recommendation yeah. there. So Jason was asking about what about putting something outdoors? Like, Obviously, when you put it outdoors, whatever that may be, whether it's Duomatrix Neo, whether it's a resin, whatever it is, you're going to be affected by the sunlight, right? Like we all tan, everything is going to change color, right? So if you use a sealer that is a UV protective sealer, it may affect it to where it's filtering, again, like a colorant. It's going to filter things to where it may not charge up as well, and it may not be able to emit as well. Uh, I've put things outside myself that I've had using our glow powders, uh, our original two glow powders. I've had them out anecdotally for me, in my house <laughs> for years, they still glow brightly, but the material itself can age. Uh, I myself did not put UV inhibitors on it because, or sealers that had UV inhibitors because I wanted it to soak in all that beautiful sunlight. Um, they glow really well. I've had them outside for five, six years, and they're still wonderful. They light my pathway along my sidewalk, but that's been my experience. I would recommend if you really want to have the full brightness and full um, longevity as far as like, you know, not just glowing very quickly, but having a long duration of glow, I would not put something that would block the UV. Um, so you kind of have to experiment and figure out what combination of products would work for you. So hopefully that answers uh, your question. Uh, so I'm going to get right into some of the demos. So this is going to show you ways to use our materials. Uh, first, I'll start off with the most basic, uh, which are going to be kind of like mixing them into uh, resins. I'm going to show you different uh, options there, and that'll get you started as far as the, the super duper ultimate basics um, if you want to get right into it. Then uh, a couple demos later, I'm going to show you ways that you can use the materials uh, to actually make uh, different types of things, with a, working with a silicone, uh, working with our coatings, Eurocoat and XTC3D. That way you have additional options uh, in, term, in terms of uh, ideas or projects that you might be working on. A lot of it too, I mean, we can't, you know, it's sometimes challenging to test our materials with everything in the world, but um, I've tested them with a lot of our materials and, and other things, and, and they work pretty well. So I think you'll be able to get a really beautiful glow, uh, glow effect uh, using our materials. If you are using these materials, there are powders. Um, I always like to use a dusk mask. Uh, if I'm going to be enclosed somewhere, you want to make sure you have room size ventilation, but just make sure you read all of the safety data sheets and whatnot, and if you want to, you can use uh, a dust mask if you're using the materials, because they, they are powders. Uh, I've already pre-dispensed everything, so you don't have to worry about it too much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with the super basic and what I call like the best, to me, one of the best combinations that you can do um, to achieve the best glow. For me, when I use a glow powder, I mean, I really enjoy them. I think they're fun, uh, but I want it to glow for a long duration, and I want it to... Um, be bright. Like to me, the point of it is I want to see it glow. You know, when you were a kid, you probably had like stars on your ceiling or some planets that glowed in the dark, and they didn't really, they may not have glowed that long or as long as you wanted to. So with our powders, you're going to definitely get a long glow as long as you follow the directions and charge them up like you should. Like I said, maybe 30 minutes to an hour uh, with direct light, and you'll, you'll get a nice glow. So here we are. I'm going to start with the first demonstration. So what I have is Smoothcast 325. That's the clear material 
that is clear amber. It is a urethane resin. It's mixed one part A to one part B by volume. Uh, pretty simple. When you're using this material, you have one part A, one part B by volume, and then you've got one part of powder. And I'm going to show you the technique that I use that we recommend that's going to work the best. So this is my little mixing cup. What I do is I put my part B in first. So I scrape the sides and the bottom of my materials. And this is after I've pre-mixed my A and my B, which I did right before we started this demo. And I've got my B in here. Then what I do is I add my powder in. So I kind of slowly sift it in and I mix. Again, watch your moisture. Urethanes are sensitive to moisture. So what will happen is, is you might notice a casting might foam or something crazy like that. But usually, as long as you um, watch and guard against moisture, you won't have any issues with it. You can see that it's starting to get thick. I still only have my part B in there. But what happens is, is if you add too much powder, it gets so thick that it's less pourable. And it's more of a brushable or trowelable effect. Uh, it's also, you know, all that money for uh, for the glow powder, you don't need it. You know, you're, it's really glowing most on the outside. So I try to make sure I'm using a flat stick, flat handle, flat everything, flat sides, flat bottom container. And I'm making sure I don't get any clumps. Sometimes you get clumps from moisture. Sometimes you get clumps um, just as a matter of like when you're, you know, like if you're baking or something and something doesn't altogether get saturated. So Notice my A and my B aren't together, so I have all the time in the world, right? I on, I'm only on this part right here. And I just try to make sure I don't have clumps. The minute I add my part A to my part B mixture, that's when my timing starts for my pot life. So I'm going to slowly pour this in. Now I have about two and a half minutes or so, um, depending on the mass of the material, to mix uh, these two together. It's actually a decent amount of time, but it's also fast enough that the material that I mixed into it, my glow powder, which was my original yellow green, it's going to be able to be suspended throughout it and not sink to the bottom like a longer setting material. So I don't have a lot of time to do a double mix because I only have about two and a half minutes. Normally with another material that has a longer pot life, um, I might do a double mix, but with this one, I feel like I don't have enough time to do a thorough mix, so I really wanna make sure I get it done. I'm scraping the sides, I'm scraping the bottoms. I really want to make sure the A and the B are incorporated together thoroughly. I can also touch the sides. When I touch the sides, I'll start to feel what we call the heat or the exotherm. It's a chemical reaction that is needed for this urethane resin to cure. So this material right here is probably one of the best ones or one of the ones that I would recommend to use because of the clarity, the clear amber. So whenever I want it to glow, that sunlight's gonna come right in really easily and charge it on up and then allow that light to really come out nicely. So I can feel it starting to get warm. And so I'm gonna start pouring. This material right here, this is Mold Star 30, which is a platinum cure silicone rubber. You do not need a release agent unless you wanna use one. But I'm gonna pour into it real quick. And then Usually what I do is if I have a little bit of extra material, um, I have like this extra mold over here. This is another silicone. This is Molstar 15. I pour my extra into here, into a second mold. I usually try to hang on and keep a, a second mold around so that, so that I don't waste the material. That's kind of how I got this guy right here is every time I had a little bit more material, I pour a little bit more and a little bit more, which I think is kind of fun. And so when this is fully cured, you're going to have this right here. So this is what it looks like fully cured. You notice the daytime appearance, water, which is like a light green color. And then the glow appearance is going to be kind of like another kind of greenish kind of color. And I'll show you what that looks like real quick in the little glow zone down here. And you can see just like a tiny bit of light and it's already glowing like very brightly. It actually can even cast a shadow depending on uh, how much it's charged. So that's what that'll look like there. I'm going to do another demo with a different material. And that's going to be Smoothcast 325. Same material, clear amber. But I want you to see what it looks like 
with our electric yellow, which is like super awesome neon yellow, looks really cool. When it glows, it's kind of like a greenish yellow, uh, but this is one of our brand new unique powders uh, that we introduced. So we have a total of eight now, but we introduced six new colors. So this is super awesome. When you mix this particular one, you're gonna do it in the same type of fashion where you do part B first. And again, you're gonna, you might see somebody who's like, I don't care, I'm gonna put part A and part B together, uh, and then I'll put my powder. You know, we can't stop you from doing what you wanna do. But I find like, I personally find that like, I have a better result when I give myself more time because this sets up so quickly. Uh, if I use another one from this series, for instance, in the 325 urethane resin series, there's also 326 and 327. One is a medium as far as pot life, and one is a longer uh, time as far as pot life. Um, those can sometimes, because of the longer pot life, although you have more time to mix, the thing is, is then the powder has more time to settle out. So you kind of have to strike a balance between what you're doing. Um, and again, the faster the better to me because these powders do tend to have more of a dense quality and will want to sink. And so to me, the best thing is like the 325 of that series, but you can always play around and, and see what you like. So you can see mixing this into the resin, it's different than the other one. The daytime appearance is this beautiful, uh, this beautiful neon yellow, which is awesome, throwback. And I'm gonna add my part A in there, and this starts my two and a half minute pot life. The material that I'm gonna pour it into, my mold, so this is also in the Mold Star series. Uh, this is actually uh, the Mold Star 20T. So it's a 20A shore hardness, platinum pure silicone rubber, but the T stands for translucent. Sometimes when you're mixing and you have a mold material and you want a translucency for a couple reasons, um, you might see where you're pouring, you know, if it's, if it's a thin enough wall that you can see where the material's pouring. Sometimes you might want a translucent material because you want to add color to it. But in this case, I love it for a mold material. And I just wanted to show different uh, mold rubbers. So again, scraping the sides, scraping the bottoms. I don't have enough time to do uh, a double mix and pour because I only have two and a half minutes. It's, it's really not a ton of time. And I want to make sure that uh, I mix this thoroughly. So what I'm doing here is, when I use a powder sometimes, I'll scrape it and then I'll kind of bump it in case there's any clumps. I'm trying to make sure that I don't have any um, clumps in my pour. When I start to feel it getting warm, that's when I know that exotherm is happening and it's going to want to start kicking on me or go from liquid to solid. So I'm going to go ahead and do my pour. What I do is I usually pour in a long thin stream in the lowest point of the mold and I'll just let it rise and seek its own level. I'm gonna go slowly. The cool thing about the colored ones for the most part um, is the color that you get is often the color very close to the color you're gonna get when it's fully cured. So I'm gonna use my little mold over here and pour the rest in so I don't waste it. There. Got that over there. Let me show you what this looks like fully cured. And because I use that clear material, which was the Smoothcast 325, you can see that the, uh, the cured piece looks almost exactly like the, uh, the liquid piece and the powder. So this right here will glow kind of like a neon greenish yellow. I'll show you that real quick. So pretty bright. But even though it may look similar to that other one that we did first, which was the original yellow green, it's actually slightly different, but the daytime appearance is what sets them apart, is you have you know, two different ones that look kind of like a yellow color, but very different daytime appearances. So even though they both might give you a, a yellow color, the daytime appearance is crazy different. You can definitely see a major difference. So let me move on to the, the third Eagle Head demo. I'll show you that real quick. So what I wanted to show you was another one of our brand new colors, which is super cute, which is our mint green. This material, if you notice, it might, if, I don't know if you're paying attention, but it's a slightly different AB. So you're going to notice that it actually um, is Smoothcast 300. So this is an opaque white material. And I wanted to show you what the difference was. You know, when you're mixing it, you won't see it, but when it cures, when you're mixing something with a white material or, or some type of opacity to it, could be off-white, 
it will have a different cure because you're fighting or competing with that white. So you know how like red and white will make pink? Um, the green will give it a slightly different green color. So I put my B in there. Again, this material I have about three minutes, but I want to save my time. So I've got my green powder, one to one to one mix ratio by volume. One part A, one part B, and then one part by volume of my powder. Here's our awesome mint green. When this glows, it's a, a slightly different type of green look. And I will show you what that looks like. But again, same idea. Any of these powders will absorb the atmospheric moisture. When you start mixing them, I would try to work in a low humidity environment. If you can do 50% humidity or less, that would probably work the best for you. Um, if you start to notice that you get clumps in it, it could be that maybe they stayed open too long, like you opened the powders and you had a high humidity environment, so you didn't really have a chance, uh, or you didn't really um, you know, give them the best opportunity to stay dry or, or moisture free. So you can always correct that. You can always do, as I mentioned earlier, and bake them out. And after you do that, then put desiccants with them and put them in an airtight container so that they don't start absorbing moisture again. So when I feel like I've got it mixed, again, my pot life hasn't started. So I wanted to make sure I had enough time to get rid of any clumps or things like that. Now what I can do is I can add my part A in. And again, scraping the sides and the bottom, one to one to one mix ratio, one part A, one part B, one part powder by volume. I'm going to slowly mix. This doesn't have a very long pot life either, about, you know, about three minutes, depending on mass. So I will not do a double mix on this one. Usually if I have a material that's maybe like five minutes long, then I feel like I'm comfortable doing a double mix. Um, but this one, I don't have a ton of time for that. I'm going to make sure that I get all the powder incorporated thoroughly, scraping the sides, scraping the bottoms. It's always important to do that a couple times as you're doing your mix so that you get the best outcome. You know, if, if there's something that goes wrong and you can't figure it out with a casting, uh, just give us a call and we'll be able to help you out with that. Most of the time it's something simple, but we will try to troubleshoot with you if you notice, you know, you know what happened basically. Um, so I can feel it starting to get a little bit warm on the sides. And that's a good indicator that you know it's going to go from liquid to solid or start curing up. So I'm pouring it into a, another platinum cure silicone rubber mold, no release agent needed. This is Mold Star 16. This one's actually uh, similar to this green one I have over here, except it sets up really quickly. And again, pouring in a long, thin stream, and be good to go. I'll pour the rest into my little side mold over here, so don't waste the material. And be good there. What this looks like when it cures, now imagine because I mixed it with the material that's going to turn white, so the Smoothcast 300, you get kind of like this light green color. You'll notice kind of like over here, or here right here, it's kind of a darker green. Um, because this is going to, when it cures, it's going to turn white, um, it's white fighting that green powder. So you wind up with, instead of this darker color, uh, you get this kind of like lighter green. If I were to have used Smoothcast 325, that's something to where it would have stayed this darker green color. And so what I want to do is I want to show you a comparison board that I made just for you guys which shows the different uh, glow powders mixed in an opaque material, which is Smoothcast 300, and then mixed uh, in Smoothcast 325, which is the clear amber. So I'm going to give you a minute to take a look at these. And so these over here on the right, this is Smoothcast 325, and over here is Smoothcast 300. So this is Smoothcast 325 down this row. This is Smoothcast 300 down this row. These are all of our powders. We've got Flamingo pink, creamsicle, electric yellow, mint green, bold blue, purple passion, the original uh, yellow green, and the original blue green. Notice right now me holding it, this is the daytime look, right? So we've got it in the daylight. Um, probably the, the one that I noticed that has the most dramatic effect in nighttime is the purple. Um, and so we'll go ahead and show you what they look like in a daytime effect, which is kind of cool. So, and then our nighttime effect also. And so in the nighttime effect, look at that purple. You can see a dramatic change from daytime to nighttime. And depending on what you want to do, you can keep that in mind knowing that daytime and nighttime have to look the same. 
Um, and it also depends on what material you mix these powders into. Um, using the clear material, like the Smoothcast 325 or a translucent, like say 57D, is going to give you probably the brightest glow and the most true um, color to the powder, um, as opposed to something that's off-white or white, which is going to affect the outcome. So this guy, let me put this down here. And again, if anybody has any questions, you can always uh, put them in the comments. Um, but until then, I'm going to move into the next demo, which is something different than resin. To me, resin's like the most common thing. That's probably the number one thing that we see people mixing these materials into, but it's certainly not the only thing. There are a lot of other things that people mix um, glow powders into, uh, and I'm going to tell you about one right now, which is our silicone rubbers. That could be for a mask or an outfit or other things. I'm going to show you, instead of doing these horizontal pieces, I'm going to show you how to make a vertical piece, um, uh, this carrot. So I'm going to show you how to do not exactly the carrot, but this is the carrot mold, and I'm going to show you how to make kind of like a marble or a wave or a ribbon effect, how I do it. And I'm sure uh, people have many, many different techniques to get a marble or a wave appearance. But it's something that we get asked about a lot, and I thought it might be kind of cool to share how to do that, or at least one technique. So what I'm using is one of our very popular silicones, Ecoflex 0030. That's a platinum cure silicone. So you can see here, part A and part B, they actually look kind of the same. Um, they're basically like a translucent, milky kind of white. Uh, you could add colorant to it. I've, I've tried adding color to it. You can use our silk pig colorants and add right to it. Uh, again, it's similar to adding, uh, using an opaque material. It does compete a little bit with uh, the charging and the glow, uh, but you could still do it. Uh, I'm going to use two colors today. I'm going to use our bold blue, and I'm going to use the purple passion. And the reason I chose those is I like to use, and again, you can do what you want, but I like to have a dark and a light so that um, one kind of shows off and then one's kind of the background, um, so you can see what that might look like. Uh, when you do this, I've done it with three and four colors. You just have to be diligent with adding different colors to it um, so that you get the effect that you want. It's also sometimes challenging to know what it's going to look like until you demold. So depending on what you want to do, uh, you might find that you get you know, the super awesome best experience doing X, Y, Z, and you try it again, and then it doesn't look good. But it's also kind of exciting to see what the demold looks like. So I'm going to get right into it. Um, the mold that I'm using is a unique material. So it's called Compact 45. This is actually a urethane rubber. Most of the time, uh, you, you would experience cure inhibition if I were to put a silicone into a urethane rubber. Cure inhibition would mean that the material wouldn't cure properly. It might stay tacky, wet, even completely uncured um, at the point of contact or in general. Um, this is one of our unique formulations, the Compact 45, to where I don't even need a release agent, and I can pour our materials in here and demold very easily. So this is the carrot mold, so it's basically upside down. It's like this. And so I'm going to show you how I do it. And again, everyone's kind of got their own technique, but this is what I like to do. So I've got my A and my B, and this has about a 45-minute pot life and it's got about a four hour cure. 45 minute pot life is decent. Like you actually have time to do a double mix and you have time to sit there and kind of think about how you want to, um, how you want to design uh, your pores. So what I'm gonna do, if I don't knock everything over, is I'm going to combine my A and my B into one container. So once they touch, my 45 minute pot life starts. No problem, 45 minutes is good. Five minutes would be harder. Um, but 45 minutes gives me time to uh, think about it and, and decide what I'm going to do. So when I put my A and my B together, because these are clear, it does make them hard to know if I got a positive mix or not. Like you can't, you know, if I use two different colors, like a blue and a white, and I got a light blue, um, I could tell, oh, there's no streaks in it. But when you have something clear like this, it's really important, especially, um, you know, with it being clear that you do a double mix you know, as long as your pot life allows it, so that you can make sure that you don't have any curing issues. So I scrape the sides and the bottom, same sticks. So these sticks are flat on the bottom, flat on the sides, and my containers are also flat. You don't want to mix in the center only or kind of haphazard. You want to really incorporate everything. You want to scrape the sides and the bottoms just like you would with the resins. 
I do this multiple times and then I go back and forth. I scrape the sides and the bottoms to make sure everything is incorporated. Last thing you want to do is spend all your time and money doing this and then all of a sudden it doesn't set up for you because of something simple like that. So I scrape the sides, I scrape the bottoms. I do this um, fairly vigorously. And then what I'm going to do is the double mix. This is helping me ensure that I get a really good mix. So as I'm doing this, and I feel like, ooh, okay, this is good. I got it mixed really well. I have my other container here. I'm going to do this all over again. Um, sometimes if you've got a fast material that sets up so quickly, you may not have time to do it. But if you can, it is something that we highly recommend uh, to get the best results. Oftentimes it's something to where, you know, maybe you miss something on the bottom of the container uh, or, or, you know, something on the sides that you missed, but doing this helps ensure that you got it all together. So let me throw that away. Again, you can't even tell that it was mixed, right? Because it kind of looks like the exact same thing as it always looked like. Um, so this is a really good way, again, to make sure that you've done it right. Scraping the sides. I'm going to scrape the bottoms just to get that all together. And what I'm going to do next, because I had that 45 minutes pot life, I have time. Once I've got this perfect mix, I actually have time now because I'm using two different colorants, I'm using the purple and the blue uh, glow powders, my bold blue and my purple passion. I'm going to pour these into two containers and then I'm going to mix the powders into them. This is how I'm going to get uh, my ribbon or my wave or if you want to call it a marble look. So now that this has been mixed thoroughly, right, scraping the sides, scraping the bottoms, um, you just make sure you got it all together. At this point, you could also add colorant if you wanted, but I want them to. I want this to stay all natural, kind of like this translucent. I'm going to pour as close to half as I can into one, try to be even about it, and pour the other one. See if I can get them to match. And you could do multiple. You don't have to do just two. You could do three, four, whatever that you felt comfortable with. And so now my A and my B are mixed. I have that long pot life. And I'm now ready to add these powders. Something that I've noticed uh, from using these powders for, for quite a while now is when I use them with the silicone, um, if I do one to one by volume mix ratio and I do one part by volume uh, for powder, it works totally fine. It's great. You get a beautiful look. But sometimes it's a little more thick. Um, and so it's harder to pour. So for me, I added just a little bit less powder. So it and that's my personal preference. And you can play with it how you want to. One to one to one works. One to one to three quarters or half works as well. So let me go ahead and dump that in. With these, I go slowly because I'm using a thicker material. And I dump a little bit at a time. And me being casual with this is also because, again, I have that long 45 minute pot life. So I'm mixing a little at a time. And we'll get the rest in there. So even though I've already mixed my A and my B and I know it's a good mix, now I've got to do another mix to make sure that I've got my powder completely incorporated. You can see already that it's thicker than it was. Like, you can see that powder made it thick. And so, you know, adding more powder is just going to make it thicker. So if that's what you're into and you want that, go for it. But for me, um, I, it's still thick enough, but not thick enough to where it prevents me from pouring. Uh, but it's still something where I can feel a major difference when I'm mixing this. I'm actually putting a little bit more effort into it because these powders have, have increased the viscosity. So this guy is ready. This one's sitting here. Now I'm going to do my purple. Again, same idea, slowly, a little bit at a time. And as that goes in, uh, you'll start to see, oops, you'll start to see that the powder will get absorbed into it. You want to make sure that you mix it all in so there's no dry areas left. Like this would be a terrible mix, right? So you want to make sure that you get all of that powder in there that it's not dry. All of it's saturated and completely incorporated so it's a homogeneous mix. So now, scraping the sides and the bottoms. Again, this is much thicker. You can definitely see there's a thick quality to it. The mix, the mix viscosity has been increased due to the powder. So this is where I get my little ribbon technique or my little marbling technique. I have one more mixing container. So this guy's right here. I got my mold ready too. So what I try to do is I alternate. So I do a little bit of one, a little bit of other. So 
think backwards too, because this will be the tip of it. So I pour a little bit of this guy, and then I pour a little bit of this guy. I kind of just go back and forth. And like I said, if I had a third or fourth color, I could do it. Uh, I find this gives it a really cool look. Um, you can play with it and do whatever you need to do, but uh, it's kind of fun to come up with different ones. And I'll show you some examples afterwards of different things that I've made in different color combinations. Uh, it's definitely fun to play with. So same thing with the resin. Uh, when I have a little bit of extra, I usually don't just throw it away. I usually have uh, an extra mold. So this was my extra little resin mold, and this is my extra silicone mold. So this is a hard plastic, so no release is needed. So any of my extra, uh, I don't like to waste it. So I just pour a little bit in here, and I end up with some kind of trivet or something, uh, you know, whatever my, whatever my uh, mold would be. But I, I like doing this, so I get something kind of interesting. And I kind of swirl it sometimes and, and do all that. So that's secondary to all this. And I just keep building as I go, as time goes, and whenever I have projects, I just add to them. So now what I'm going to do is use my Compact 45 mold. So I, you can see these different striation lines in here that I built, and you don't even know what's inside. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour, and I pour it, and I kind of undulate a little bit, I guess. Um, and I pour it to the very bottom, and then I try to like shift it and move it to where I get like different cool effects. And I move it to try to get like that quote unquote ribbon look. This is just kind of what I do. You can see as it's pouring out that you're getting a unique look. As I'm going, I go to the very top. And I'll let that kind of settle out. And then again, whatever my extra is, I go in and I just pour it here. Oops. I pour out my extra and I usually end up with another cool casting instead of wasting it. OK. And there we are. So when this is demolded, uh, because it's a Compact 45 mold, I didn't have to put any release agent with this Platinum Cure silicone. And it'll just demold. So let me show you what that will actually look like so you can get an idea uh, of, of what the casting possibilities are. So when you use these materials, uh, you know, like I said, it was the carrot mold, right? So we've got the carrot. Um, the blue and the purple that I demolded is actually this right here. So if you look closely at it, you will actually see there's some ribbon marbleization. And what I'll do is I'll try to let you see that. So this is obviously the daytime effect, right? Uh, if I show you the nighttime effect, I'm going to quick try to glow it and I'll put in our little glow world zone so you can get an idea. So that was the bold blue mixed in with the purple passion in a ribbon or marble effect. And here's what it looks like in Glowland. So I don't know if you can see it quite as easily. I'll try to hold still. Look at that, look at my fingers. Like, look at the light being reflected onto my fingers. That's how bright it was. And I only put this UV light on it for like, what, three seconds? It's amazing. And you can get an idea. I also want to show you some of the other examples just to show you the possibilities. These are some of the other ones that were made using a similar technique, similar type of materials, obviously our, our glow powders and your uh, Ecoflex 0030 and things like that. So check these guys out. Pretty cool. And these are just different things that people might want to do as far as marble effects and things like that in our silicone rubbers. Were there any questions, Jason, or everything good? All right. I'm going to put this over here. And I'm going to move into uh, our coatings demo. Let me put this over here. And get started on the coatings demo. So with the coatings, um, it's another way that you can uh, use our materials instead of like mixing and pouring into something. You can actually apply it in a very thin layer and do coatings. Um, another way that you can do it is also like a gel coat, which is, a, I guess you could call that like a type of coating. So, when you're looking at um, coatings or thin layers, uh, we have a bunch of different materials, but this will segue kind of into it with a little bit of a, uh, a mix of gel coat slash coating um, and a way to save time and money. So, you know, when you're using these materials, you saw how quickly I just made all of these castings, right? I could make a ton of them. Um, but I want to show you this Moldstar 30 mold, which is a silicone rubber. 
And this is um, a face, obviously. You can kind of see it's a face. You might recognize uh, the face. And so silicone mold, I don't need any release agent. But look how big this cavity is. I mean, that is huge. It's like bigger than my like two or three fists, right? Maybe four. It's a lot of resin, a lot of glow powder that would be needed. Um, it would be expensive. Um, there's a way that we can show, that I'll show you, that will save money. Uh, it also saves a little bit of time, but uh, what it really is is creating a face coat or a gel coat, however you've heard it uh, being described. And I'm going to use our uh, Flamingo Pink Powder and our Eurofill 11. So if you have never heard of our Eurofill powders, we have a whole bunch of different um, filler powders. They can be used with a number of different materials uh, of ours, such as silicones, urethanes, et cetera. Just depends on your project, what's most appropriate. But for this, the Eurofill 11 is a fiber-based filler. Uh, one reason I like it is it's lightweight, and it kind of almost like disappears. You don't really see fibers or anything like that, but it, what it does is it increases the viscosity or it thickens the material so that I'm able to brush it. Um, what I'm doing is, is Smoothcast 325, which is clear, and the reason I like it is fast setting, and it also is that clear amber that is going to allow the light to come in and charge it and really showcase um, the beautiful pink flamingo color. Um, but the other thing, too, is, is when I'm using this on its own, the, the material is just so super loose, almost close to water and viscosity. So I need to thicken it because when I do a gel coat or a face coat, all I'm doing is I'm brushing enough material up into this mold to get a thin layer. So as I brush this in, I'm doing a thin layer so that all of that precious glow powder is going to be in the front where it counts, right? Where all the glowing and charging has to happen. On the inside, where no one's going to see it, uh, it's, it's going to be occluded because it's all going to be on the front. You don't need to put glow powder inside of there. It's not, it's not doing anything for you. You're going to get a very similar or almost identical glow just by doing the gel coat, which works really well for bigger pieces. Um, so let me show you how to do that. Uh, very simply. So I have my A and my B. So what I like to do, and, and everyone's a little bit different, but I prefer to give myself, again, more time. So I'm going to put my part B in first. This material only has about a two and a half minute pot life, which is why time is critical for me. So I got my part B in there. Now, I like to add the Eurofill powder in. I feel like when it mixes it, it gives it like a creamy feel and it's easier to mix the rest of it in. And just to clarify, this is Eurofill 11? Yeah, Jason okay. was asking me which powder this was of our Eurofills. This is Eurofill 11. So it's a fiber-based powder. So you can kind of see it's slowly absorbing. And as I mix this in, you're going to get like this creamy look. So right now, no pot life has begun. I still have my full pot life. I'm just trying to give myself a little bit of an edge by mixing this in first. Eurofill being a dry powder, just like any other dry powder, um, like the glowworm powders, you need to guard it against moisture. And you can take care of it in the same way that you would the other dry powders, um, like glowworm, which would be baking it out on a cookie sheet uh, at a low, mild temperature, about 150 Fahrenheit for several hours. And then, you know, obviously don't let it go back to like a high humidity environment. You want to put it in a, a closed container that's airtight. So right now, this stuff is like, look, it's not even like pouring out, right? Like it's like so, it's, it's pretty creamy. Next, what I'll do is I'll add my powder in. So this is my, pink, my flamingo pink. When I add this powder in, it's going to get even thicker and almost, um, I'll say it looks kind of dry a little bit when you mix it in, but never fear. It's going to be fine. What I want to try to do is saturate as much of it as I can before I add my part A in. Um, so for this particular recommendation for doing a gel coat, it's one part A, one part B by volume of the Smoothcast 325 resin, and then one part by volume of the glow powder, and then one part by volume of the Eurofill 11 filler. I have tried this with more powder, like double the powder, and it's crazy. It's so thick, it's like spackly, and then you can get like air pockets in it because it's not smooth enough when you brush it. And personally, depending on my project, I wouldn't do it for something like this because the more you add, the thicker it gets. So using one part of the Eurofill uh, by volume is really an ideal mix ratio. So now look at it and it's kind of like chunky almost and nothing's happening because I haven't added my part A. But 
you'll notice it's going to become more of a brushable, creamy consistency once I loosen it up with the part A. So let's get all of that in there. Again, I only have about two and a half minutes, so I'm not doing a double mix. I just have to be very uh, diligent with my mixing here. Again, I'm using my flat-sided sticks, and I'm just going to make sure that it all looks homogenous in one beautiful mixture. So as I do this, you can see that it's not like a normal liquid. It's pretty thick. If I notice clumps, I usually try to like tap them out. I scrape the sides, I scrape the bottoms. I changed my mixing stick to this smaller one. Um, you could honestly use any mixing stick, but for some reason, whenever I mix the Eurofil 11 and then a second powder, I feel like I get a better mix. That's just me when I use the smaller stick. That's just something that I personally like doing. But as long as you have a flat stick like this and you can get and scrape the sides and scrape the bottoms, you'll be fine. So now what I'm going to do is once it's thoroughly mixed, I'm going to pour it in. I'll put it on here. So I'm going to pour it in. And normally you might think oh, I'm just going to walk away and you know, like a normal pour, you just walk away. Look at how thick it is. Look, it's very, very thick. You want to make sure that you get it all in there. And then I have my brush. And I'm going to keep moving it along the sides. There's a nose cavity that I want to make sure I don't get air pockets. I brush it up a tiny bit uh, along the edges just to make sure that I get all the edges. And as I'm going, I can feel it starting to pull. Notice it's coating the sides because of that filler. If this were something where I didn't add the filler, it would still probably be pooling a lot more at, at the lower cavities, and it wouldn't cling to the sides as much. So that Eurofill made it to where I can do this face coat or gel coat. And you will still see bald spots, because you can still see the, a little bit of the blue from the mold. So you will see parts shining through, which is OK, because my intention ultimately is I'm going to wind up uh, doing three of these very thin gel coats. Um, this is about, in certain areas, it might be a sixteenth of an inch. In other areas, it might be up to an eighth of an inch at the most. Some areas are, like I said, sixteenth of an inch. I just want to keep this moving so that I get a, as even of a coat as I can and I don't have any air pockets because you can't go back. So you can see this as I'm going, starting to pull. Like, notice it's clinging. That's going to be your cue to stop it because if you keep doing it, you're just going to destroy it. So I'm not going to sit here and do three of the exact same layers, but I would come back and I would do the exact same mix ratio. I would do a second one after I let this partially cure. So for me in my timing, when I've done this uh, with the Smoothcast 325, um, I usually wait maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, um, and I test it. I keep my brush and I test my brush to see if my brush is partially cured. Uh, partially cured would be no longer liquid, but on your gloved finger, nothing came off on there. Like it's not still like that you could disturb it. Tacky is okay, but maybe 20 minutes or so and you're fine at room temperature, 73 Fahrenheit. And I would come back again a second time and then a third time. That's usually what we recommend to get a nice gel coat. Ultimately, I'll show you what that looks like. Ultimately, you're going to have this guy right here. So if you take a look at this one right here, this is what it looks like, and I'm going to try to show you. It's hollow, right? So what are your options at this point? So it's pretty sturdy. It's only about may, barely maybe an eighth of an inch in thickness with the three layers. Um, so I could leave it hollow like this, depending on what I was doing. I mean, I could hang that on my wall, right, for display. If it were something I were wearing like a mask, I, would, you know, I don't always have to brush it in. I could have slushed it in, but I made it such a consistency that I wanted to brush it. You can add just a little bit if you prefer to slush cast it or roto cast it. Um, those are other options, but I preferred to brush that one in. Um, I could also backfill this with foam if I wanted to. And we have expanding urethane foams, which could go in the back. I could also pour just clear resin um, that had no glow powders or fillers in it. And that would save me money because I'm not using the glow powders. Ultimately, this is your money zone. This is the part that's going to absorb the, the sunlight, store it, and then emit the glow. So back here, uh, nothing really happening back here, unless it's a 360 piece that you want to see it all. Uh, but this, this outer, outer shell is a, a quick and easy way to save money and time. And I'll show you what this looks like down here, which is in Glow World. And you might know, recognize this face. But 
yeah, it's a simple way to make something, and you can see how thin it is, just super thin. Just three thin layers and barely any glow powder used compared to pouring this entire cavity. So I'm gonna move this to the side, make some room, and get started on uh, the next demonstration. which is another type of, I would call it more of a traditional type of coating, which is right here. This is using our uh, Uricote. If you're not familiar with Uricote, uh, it's basically a urethane rubber that's meant or designed to be a coating. Uh, it goes on in thin layers. So the mix ratio is a little different. It's not by volume, it's actually by weight. So I pre-measured these out. It's 100 parts A to 10 parts B by weight. Um, I have maybe eight minutes at room temperature to mix and apply this, but uh, if I want to give myself the most time, I would use this guy right here, which is just this cute little aluminum tray, cheap and easy that I made. And when I mix it up, I'm going to pour it in here. By spreading out the mass into a thin section, that's going to give me more time. Lower mass is going to um, increase my uh, pot life as opposed to a bigger mass where my pot life would be lesser. So. Like I, know, I mentioned with the, uh, the silicone, when I use thicker materials, like this is a urethane rubber, like the silicone rubber, it's thicker than resin, I notice that I need less powder um, and I still get a really good effect. When it, I've, I've, I've added a whole bunch of powder to it and it was so thick that I, could, I couldn't really get like a, a nice smooth outcome. So after playing with for a while, for me, I add less powder. You can adjust it to what you want to do and what work makes sense for your project. Um, but just so that you know, you have options, but when, when you're using something thicker, um, like a urethane rubber or a silicone rubber, I think a little bit less powder could be beneficial to you. So I'm going to mix that right here into this little guy right here. This is an overnight cure, but if you're doing multiple layers, uh, you do have time to come back and do um, multiple coats. Maybe 20, 30 minutes you could come back when it's partially cured. So I'm just going to put this into a bigger mixing cup so that I have room. And again, it was 100 to 10 by weight. And get that in there. Throw that out. And like I said, I don't use as much powder. I, I go slow. This is our electric yellow, one of our new ones, one of my favorites. And I'm brushing this onto uh, a foam star. So that's an EVA, uh, it's actually a six millimeter piece of foam star, EVA foam, flexible. And the reason I'm using it with the Eurocoat is because a lot of times when you're doing a urethane rubber coating, what's the point in using a rubber coating is, you know, maybe I want it to be flexible so it moves with my piece. And so that's why I chose a piece that had um, some flexibility to it, like this EVA foam. I could put it on to another urethane rubber if I wanted to as well, um, but I thought this might be kind of cool to show you, like for cosplay or props or some kind of art project, you might want to do that and you can make cool stuff. So you can notice here, this is a beautiful, vibrant, color. This is a translucent uh, material anyway, so that you, you will be able to see a vibrancy. Pot life hasn't started because I didn't put my part B in. So let's go ahead and do that. Dump that in there. Scrape out what I can. Put that out. So now I'm going to mix this in. And you could add colorant to this too if you wanted to. I feel like the, uh, the yellow color is just pretty on its own, so I don't add color, but you could if you wanted. So I'm mixing it, scraping the sides and the bottom. It, eight minutes is a decent amount of time, but you have to be careful. If something is a warmer climate, you're gonna have less of a pot life. If it's a cooler climate, it may not set up properly or take um, longer for the pot life to set up. So you really have to consider what you're doing. I am using this green film on here. Uh, because this material will peel right off of it. That's why I decided to use this instead of just paper. Um, but when I'm doing this, notice I'm doing it on a flat area. So when I brush it on, it's going to kind of come off the edges a little bit. You can always trim it when it's cured. But if you're doing a vertical, um, you know, it's going to drip to the bottom. So keep that in mind when you're working on the projects that, you know, different contours are going to have different effects. And you can go really thin with this too. You don't, you're not trying to go thick. You can go maybe a sixteenth of an inch at a time. Um, if you wind up using this material, and let's say you buy, like I said, a trial kit, um, if you use the entire trial kit, it'll cover almost six and a half square feet in one trial kit at about one thirty-second of an inch. 
So two very thin layers, and you can, you can get a decent amount of coverage on there. The thickness of the layers is kind of up to you. So what I'm going to do to give myself more time is I'm going to pour it in here, which is going to lower the mass. Instead of being in one big old clump in this cup, I'm going to reduce the mass by putting it right here. And I'll scrape it all out. Throw that away. You can use a chip brush um, like one of these uh, if you want to. I personally have found when I work with the Eurocoat, I've really um, started liking using uh, these brushes, which are the foam brushes. I like that it's a flat area and I feel like I'm almost like squeegeeing it a little bit. So for me, that's what I like. So notice the mass was in one mold cup and now I spread it out. So reducing that mass gives me more time. So you can see it's already thick with that powder added into it. So adding more powder would just make it even more thick. So here I go with my application. I'm going thin. I could do as many layers as life allows, but for this, I prefer to do thin because I can always add more. If you add too much to it um, and you make it really, really thick, it'll, you know, it will kind of flatten and settle on its own. But if you're doing that towards the end of its pot life, I have noticed that it's starting to firm up, right? Like at the end of the pot life, it's going from liquid to uh, more solid rubber. And it tends to want to just hold that shape as opposed to kind of flattening out. So I'm going to show you, um, once, this, once I finish applying this, I'm going to show you, I did two layers on one. And I'll show you what that looks like um, in our little glow zone so you can see how flexible it is. The cool thing about these powders is they kind of conform to whatever material you put them in. So a urethane rubber coating, real thin, it'll move. Silicone rubber, it's going to move with that silicone. Uh, a resin, a, let's say a rigid resin, it's going to stay in that rigid resin really nicely. And, you know, it depends on what you're doing, but these powders are so flexible. Um, and it's pretty neat, the things that you can do with them. So what I'm going to do now, you can see that the pot life's starting to um, tighten up. So I'm running out of time. If I were to keep adding to this, I'm just kind of taking away from what I already put on there. And I don't want it to pull. You can kind of see it pulling a little bit. So there's the coating right here, and it's going to peel off from this uh, green film that I have. But let me show you what this looks like uh, fully cured, and I want to show you what it looks like in the glow zone especially. So I did two layers on one side, and then one I just did one layer. So this is the fully cured Eurocoat Star, the white foam star, EVA foam or craft foam. So this side was one layer, this side is two layers. You can only really see the difference when I kind of show it in the light and you see the thickness. So really, really, really thin layers. I mean, there's barely any on there, but just enough that you can see now I have this cute little star. And what I'll do is I'll show what that looks like in the glow zone. I'll do a quick pre-charge and I'll put it in here. And I want you to see it kind of bending. So notice it's flexible, even at two layers, you can see it flexing just fine and that's with the Eurocoat. So you can see it moving, no problem with it. You don't see any issues with the glow powder at all. So pretty cool option, especially like maybe you're making like a cosplay outfit or something like that, or something for theater, and you need something durable as a coating on the outside of something, but you need it to move with the actor or you know which, with whatever character you're trying to be. Um, this is a nice durable way to get that effect. So pretty cool Eurocoat. Um, my final demo is another coating, and it's actually one that you may have heard of before. It's called XTC3D. It, typically, people will apply it to uh, 3D printed materials, uh, various types of 3D printed materials. Um, but with this particular one, I'm going to apply it to, this is actually a moon that one of my colleagues printed for me. So this is PLA. And you can use various things, ABS, PLA. You can use many different things with the XTC3D. This is an epoxy coating that's going to be rigid. So one reason you could use it is to shore it up. Maybe you want it to be um, stronger. Maybe it's a, a weak piece. Um, on this one, some of the supports um, were blue. So I have a blue and a white. So I can make this a uniform color you know, and hide some of that. Or maybe I just want something, a uniform color in general but let's just jazz it up and make it glow in the dark because moons glow in the dark. So I chose this cool looking creamsicle color. 
and I'm going to show you how to mix it together. This mix ratio is two to one uh, by volume. So I have my part A, my part B, and then my powder. Again, same idea I noticed with coatings, less powder is better because it gets really thick otherwise and makes it harder and more chunky to pour. And I prefer it to be more smooth and give me a nice glossy effect. So I also have a tray here, which is going to give me a little bit more pot life because I'm lowering the mass as opposed to keeping it into a cup. So I have, I kept this little thing. This is made of polypropylene, so it won't stick to it. But I kind of made this, um, this little cup holder to help me. So this is going to be where I'm going to coat it. Before I coat it, I'm going to mix these up. So with this particular material, you can add color to it as well. But my orange is going to suffice for that beautiful bright color. So creamsicle is what I'm using. So I'm going to put this in here, my part A, because it's a little bit more material. I find that it's going to be easier to mix the powder into the part A. And throw that away. Here we go. I go slowly and I just, again, mix a little bit at a time, as opposed to just like dumping the whole thing in. I kind of go slow and there's the rest of it there. And again, you want to make sure it's saturated. No pot life has started here. As I mix this up, um, you'll start to notice that, oops, you'll start to notice that um, because it's a clear material, the color stays true. I'm still getting that beautiful orange color as opposed to an opaque material or something um, that would be competing with that. So I'm going to scrape the sides in the bottom here. Scrape the sides, scrape the bottoms. Here, here, here. Make sure there's no dry pockets of powder anywhere. The good thing about using an epoxy is that it doesn't absorb atmospheric moisture. Like it's not effect, you know, even though the power, the powders might absorb atmospheric moisture, it doesn't cause a moisture reaction because this is an epoxy. But you could still get clumps. So you still want to make sure that you're not getting clumps on there because when you brush a thin layer, you're certainly going to notice that. So now I'm going to add my part B in there. I'm going to mix that in. It'll loosen it up even more to where I'm going to get even a more brushable effect. With this particular material, you can do multiple layers. I typically do two. You could get away with one. Um, when I was doing uh, this uh, final piece to show you the after piece, I personally really enjoyed the one layer because um, there's actually all these like craters on this moon that was printed. And with the one layer, I felt like I could see the detail better. But then when I did two layers, I kind of liked that too because then the glow was a little stronger. So you can kind of play around and, and figure out what works better for you and what your des uh, you know, desired outcome is. Um, I'm going to do a double mix on this one. Put that in here. Get that all in there. OK. And again, I just keep mixing. Um, with this particular material, I have about 10 minutes in this mass. Uh, which, you know, might be fine for you if you're doing it. But if I want to give myself more time, uh, I like to do uh, this thin, uh, putting it in a thin layer, and that'll give me about 20 minutes. Um, it'll cure in maybe like four hours, or, uh, four hours or so. But at the same time, you know, depending on what you're doing, if you're doing a second layer, you might come back in like 20, 30 minutes, do another layer. With this particular material, the cool thing about it is a little goes a long way. So one ounce, just one tiny little ounce, which was that little cup, is going to, if you apply it at 1 64th of an inch, um, cover about 100 square feet, which is like a crazy amount. You know, obviously, if you're doing multiple layers or you're going thicker, it might be a little bit less. But that is a lot. So this stuff really goes a long way. So I'm going to pour this. And like I had said, I'm trying to reduce that mass to give myself more time. So. Again, you can use either one of these that you like better. I don't know. I've been really liking, you know, like I said, these uh, foam pieces. But, you know, when you have layer lines on here, like from a, an FDM style print or, or, or 3D print that um, may not have been perfect, one of the things XTC 3D was designed for was to fill those layer lines. So I'm almost like, if you imagine little bumps, I'm almost like squeegeeing it into those layer lines without adding a crazy thickness. So I'm going to bring this over here squeak. 
and I'm going to gently start applying. You, I like to go thin. You can always add more, but it's, it's like such a mess if it drips a lot. So I like to go thin. And then afterwards, um, you can always come back and touch up areas because with gravity, it's going to go to the bottom. So I always start at the top and then go down because you know that's where it wants to drip anyway. And then um, in coating all of this, you saw me really only use maybe uh, like a little more than a tablespoon and a half, something like that. I barely used anything and maybe an ounce and a half of material. And you can see how much is here that I can go back and coat. And like I said, I prefer to go a little more slowly just because I'm not trying to overdo it but I'm also keeping in mind my pot life. And as you go through it and you start applying stuff, you could do half of this and then come back. You might, you might decide, oh, I like to hold it. You know, I prefer to hold it than putting it on a stand. You know, you could do it like this as well. Kind of depends on you and how you want to apply it. Um, but if, uh, if you decide to come back and do a second layer, just let this partially cure, maybe come back in about 20, 30 minutes or so. Um, and then you can do a second layer on top of it, or a third, depending on how much you want to do. So just so that you can see, it's pretty thin. You can still see through it. Like, I'm not trying to go crazy thick. And then what I'll do is, I'm going to move this to the side. And I'm going to show you my after. Put this over here. And I'll show you my after piece, which is one layer here and two layers here. So let me see if I can get that here. You'll notice that the one layer is very thin and the second layer is just slightly darker. Like I said, the goal is not to go crazy thick. I mean, unless you want to, but why? It's gonna drip and go crazy. So let me show you what this looks like in our little world of glow. And I'll try to pre-charge this a little bit for you. And there it is. Now is where the one and the two layers are a little bit more evident. So the, like I was saying, I like one because I made a moon and I really want to be able to see those craters, which is kind of cool. But then, you know, the sacrifice is, ooh, with two layers, I can still kind of see the craters, but look at that glow. It's a huge, hugely different glow with two barely anything thin layers. So it really depends on what your, what your goals are and what you want to do. But, you know, you also saw how powerful our glow powders are. I use that flashlight for like two seconds and look at this already glowing in an amazing way. If you do what we say and kind of what we recommend in terms of glowing, like charge it up for, you know, as little as five minutes, but really 30 minutes or so is better, you'll get a really strong sustainable glow. So just so that you can see that. So just to wrap things up, uh, you know, I'll go over one more time just to kind of summarize what we've learned today. Um, we talked about using our glowworm to transform your, your castings in minutes, how to use glowworm to save you time and money. Uh, we introduced six new colors to our original two. We talked about material options that are most effective uh, with the glow powders to get the look that you want. We also talked about coating the model surface, doing that gel coat in that face versus casting into the molds and pouring the entire thing solid. And then finally, we discussed about charging them, how to get your finished castings to have the best and maximum amount of glow time. We also talked about different materials, and I demoed a whole bunch of different ones. Demoed the glowworm powders, the original green and blue, purple passion, flamingo pink, creamsicle orange, mint green, bold blue, and electric yellow. Uh, we also used Smoothcast 325 and Smoothcast 300 urethane resins. We used Ecoflex 0030 Platinum Cure Silicone Rubber. We used Eurocoat Urethane Rubber Coating, XTC 3D Epoxy 3D Print Coat, and our filler, Eurofill 11. So I just want to thank everybody for tuning in and learning with me You know, as we go through this. If you have any questions that come up later, please feel free to give us a call. And again, my name is Heather, and tune in to our social media, our Facebook, our Instagram, for our next YouTube Lives. Thanks, and have a great day.